it seems to me that if you want to find intolerance, you look for atheistic regimes. Would you rather live in North Korea or South Korea? Okay. South Korea is Christian. Don't North answer Korea that is communist. Yeah. Well, you yeah. cited many examples in your book. Yeah. Well, well, the thing is, this this is a a trick, and this is one of the reasons why I'm. It's not a trick. I, I'm not a fan of the term atheism. I mean, atheism is a is a term totally without content. It's like being a non-astrologer. You know, we, we don't have a word for someone who's not an astrologer. We, and, we don't, and if astrologers suddenly became ascendant in our society, we wouldn't need to invent non-astrology as a discipline. We could talk about reason and science and evidence and common sense and bullshit mm -hmm. and put astrologers in their place. And I, mm -hmm. so it could be with religion. Um, and so this, this notion that uh, Stalin and Hitler and Pol Pot uh, were doing what they did because of atheism, because of non-belief in God. I mean, ask yourself, is, is too much skeptical inquiry really what's wrong with North Korea? I mean, the North Koreans are a cargo cult armed with nuclear weapons right now. They think that the food aid that we give them is a, is a devotional offering to the genius of their dear leader. They are systematically impoverished both physically and in terms of information. They are, they, 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 too much knowledge, any knowledge is too much knowledge uh, in North Korea. This is not a, a, a paradise of reasonableness. Now, all I'm advocating is that we use the same standards of rationality that we use in every other area of our lives when people start making claims about the divine origin of certain books and the virgin birth of certain people and the glorious end to history where, where the good people will be raptured into the sky. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we should uh, apply pressure to. And it is taboo to ap apply pressure to these claims. And religious moderation, unfortunately, ramifies that taboo. I want to say, in other words, that religion is the outcome of unresolved contradictions in the material world. That if you make the assumption that it's man-made, uh, then very few things are mysterious to you. If you make the assumption that religion is man-made, then, then you would know why, it would be obvious to you why, there are so many religions. Um, when you make the assumption that it's man-made, you will understand why it is that religion has been such a disappointment to our species, that despite innumerable revivals, um, innumerable attempts again to preach the truth, innumerable attempts to convert the heathen, innumerable attempts to send missionaries all around the world, that the same problems remain with us, that nothing is resolved by this, that we, we if, the, if all religions died out, or all were admitted to be false, instead of, as all believers will tell you, only some of them are false. In other words, we're faced with the preposterous proposition that religion, are either all of them true, or none of them true, or only one exclusive preachment is true. And none of these seem to me coherent, and all of these seem to be the outcome of a man-made cult, assumed that all of them were discredited at the same time, all of our problems would be exactly what they are now. How do we live with one another? Where indeed do morals and ethics come from? What are our duties to one another? How shall we build the just city? How shall we practice love? Uh, how, shall we, how shall we deal with the, the baser, of what Darwin called the, 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 the lowly stamp of our original origins, which comes uh, not from a, a pact with the devil or an original sin, but from our evolution as well. All these questions, ladies and gentlemen, would remain exactly the same. Emancipate yourself from the idea of a celestial dictatorship, and you've taken the first step to becoming free. One thing to notice is that the dialogue between science and religion has gone this way. It has been one of relentless and one-directional erosion of religious authority. I, I would challenge anyone here to think of a question upon which we once had a scientific answer, however inadequate, but for which now the best answer is a religious one. Now you can think of an uncountable number of questions that run the other way, where, where we once had a religious answer, uh, and now the authority of religion has been battered and nullified uh, by science and by moral progress and secular progress generally. Um, and I think that's not an accident. Uh, and the, the one area where religion still seems to uh, 
hold its ground uh, is now under assault by science, and it's it's very good that it is under assault by science. And this is the whole issue of morality and human happiness and what constitutes the good life. Uh, these are, and let me just tell you why I, I think this is a scientific question. Even the place of science is ultimately a scientific question. Um, because surely there are objective facts to be learned about the basis of human happiness. The, the moment you recognize that morality and spirituality and, and, and value is a matter of, of happiness and suffering, and that we're moving suffering uh, in the direction of happiness, uh, then you, you realize that if there are objective facts to know about human happiness, and surely there are, uh, facts about the way that genes and ideas and uses of attention and economic systems uh, social structures, all of these conspire to make us happy or miserable. Uh, and uh, again, the, 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 it's true that, that scientific discourse is just in the beginning of addressing these issues. Uh, but it, it's not too soon to say that love is better than hate in terms of ethics. And we're, we are studying these things at the level of the brain. Eventually, we will understand the brain basis of love and hate and the kinds of, of, of mechanisms, both cultural and, and personal, that uh, ramify these states of mind. Uh, and there will be right and wrong answers. And we'll find, for instance, that honor killing is a bad strategy if you want to raise compassionate men. Uh, we know that already, but we'll, at some point we will know this biochemically. It could be true. Um, but you'd have to imagine, let's say the human species has been, Homo sapiens has been with us. Some people say as long as a quarter of a million years. Uh, some say 200, some say 100,000. Francis Collins and Richard Dawkins oscillate about this. It's, no, it's not a very big argument. I'll just take 100,000, if you like. You have to imagine that human beings are born. Um, well, actually, most of them, a good, a good number of them aren't born. They die in childbirth or don't long outlive it. Uh, they're born into a terrifying world of... Uh, of the unknown, everything is a mystery to them, everything from, from, from disease to volcanic eruptions. Um, everything is, their life expectancy for the first, I don't know, many, many tens of thousands of years would be lucky to be in the 20s, probably dying agonizingly over their teeth, poorly evolved as the teeth are, and from other inheritances of, from being primates, such as the appendix that we, we don't need, such as the fact that our genitalia appear to have been designed by a committee other shortcomings of the species, uh, uh, exaggerated by, the, by scarcity, by war, by famine, by competition, and so on. And for 98,000 years or so, heaven watches this with complete indifference. And that, we know where your children go to school, by the way. Um, <laughs> heaven watches this with total indifference, and then, with 2,000 years to go on the clock, thinks, actually, it's time we intervened. This, we can't go on like this. Why don't we have someone tortured to death in Bronze Age Palestine? That should teach them. That should give them uh, the chance of redemption. You're free to believe that, but I think the, the, the designer who thought of doing it that way is a very, or was a very, cruel, capricious, random, bungling, and incompetent one. The news of this, Dr. Craig talks as if, okay, but since then, there's been, there have been more people born, so it might have been a good time in terms of population growth. Well, there are a huge number of people in the world who still haven't even heard of this idea. The news hasn't penetrated to them. Or where it has, it's been brought to them by people who Dr. Craig doesn't, doesn't think of as Christians, such as Mormons, for example. Um, the, it, it, and it's, it's taught to them in many discrepant and competitive and indeed incompatible and violently irreconcilable ways. Um, and there's been a lot of argument in the church, in the churches, all this time about, well, okay, what is the answer to that? What about all the people who never could have heard the good news, or who never will hear it, or still haven't been reached by it, and who've died not knowing about it? What happens to them? How can they be saved? Well, the argument is that it's all somehow made retrospective. And as so with so many of these arguments, I just comment on these, well, how convenient. Uh, because if you're willing to make assumptions of this kind, then really evidence is only ancillary to what you uh, are advancing. Science is the one language game we are playing where we get really straight and rigorous about what constitutes evidence, where there's a process of peer review, uh, 
uh, where you have a lot of smart people trying to prove you wrong, and where you actually win points by proving yourself wrong. And this is not what religions are up to. Religions are not uh, falsifiable in this way.